Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending today's webinar, Uncovering the Unknowns of Appium and Beyond. Before we begin, I'd like to cover three housekeeping items for our viewers. First, at the bottom of your audience console, you'll find a number of widgets for questions and additional resources. When you have questions for the presenters during the webcast, click on the Q&A widget and submit your question. We will answer as many questions as possible at the end of the webcast, and if we run out of time, we'll get back to you via email. Second, if you need any tech support during the webinar, please use the help option. Third and finally, a copy of today's slide deck is available in the resources section at the bottom of your screen. We will also email you a link to the recording of this webinar within the next few days. With that, I'll pass it off to one of our presenters for today's broadcast, Aran Kinsbrenner, Chief Evangelist here at Perfecto by Perforce. Aran, thanks for joining us on today's broadcast. Thank you, Shelby, and uh, truly excited uh, to deliver this webinar. Uh, this webinar is actually going to be full of uh, great content that uh, myself, together with uh, two distinguished uh, lead uh, consultant from ThoughtWorks, uh, prepared for you. Um, as mentioned, I am uh, the chief evangelist and also an author uh, at Perfecto by Perforce, blogger, speaker, um, and uh, if you're not following me, feel free to do so. Uh, to get more insights on what's coming uh, into in uh, our digital space. But uh, without further ado, I would like to really introduce uh, my two colleagues and presenters uh, in today's webinar, starting with uh, Sai. Sai, can you uh, introduce yourself? Sai, I think you might be on mute. Can you hear me? Ah, sorry, sorry, I was on mute. Um, uh, thanks, Iran. Uh, uh, my name is Sai, and I work with uh, ThoughtWorks, and I've been a lead consultant with ThoughtWorks for about four and a half years, and uh, and overall, I've been a quality analyst for about nine and a half years, and I'm very passionate about open source. Uh, I've been uh, contributing a lot to the open source to give back to the community on what I've learned, and at the same time, also, I maintain uh, quite a few repositories like uh, Appium, uh, uh, Tyco, and, uh, and a few more uh, on the Git. Uh, and uh, I'm also present uh, in many co international conferences like uh, Selenium, Appium. Uh, I've done a Belgrade test automation days. Uh, I've done a lot more like that, and uh, and also drive a lot of workshops on uh, Appium and best practices on uh, web automation and mobile automation. Yeah, that, that's about me. That's awesome, sign. I've seen <laughs> some of the content that you prepared for today's webinar. So uh, truly, truly insightful content. So everyone online should be uh, quite privileged to have you on board. And together with you, we have uh, Srini. Uh, Srini, can you also introduce yourself, please? Thanks, Aaron. Hello, everyone. Uh, myself, uh, Srini Vasan Shekhar, uh, APM committer, Selenium committer, APM member, and presently working as a lead consultant and ThoughtWorks and international speaker in various international conferences like Selenium Conf, APM Conf, Committer to Selenium, APM. Yep, that's me. Thank you, Srini, and uh, again, thank you both uh, for joining us today. So today's agenda is quite packed. Uh, we are going to start uh, briefly with an introduction to Perfecto and how it connects to the Appium uh, open source uh, solution. Uh, then we are going to drill down into, as the title of this webinar suggests, uh, unknowns uh, or advantages of Appium that some practitioners might not be familiar with, like the Appium Events API, video streaming from iOS devices, iOS in-app authentication testing, Android data, data matcher locator strategy. Uh, then we are going to do a short break for a slight demo of some advanced capabilities that you can do with Appium open source in the Perfecto cloud. Um, and um, uh, then we'll do an Appium 2.0 overview and Q&A. Um, um, and um, let's just uh, begin. I'm going to uh, move to the next slide. Um, Sai, Srini, can you see uh, the slides okay? Yep. Awesome. Um, okay, 
So getting started with Perfecto and Appium, uh, Perfecto as a cloud solution for both mobile application testing and web fully complies and supports Selenium for web testing and Appium for mobile native and hybrid application testing. Uh, we have a full set of documentation with code samples uh, and API and uh, extensions to Appium. So if you like to uh, get started with Perfecto running on real devices in the cloud across different locations, uh, you can go through the developers.perfectomobile.com and uh, uh, give, a, give it a try. It's quite simple. Uh, Perfecto also uh, is part of the Appium desktop. So if you work an, uh, as an Appium developer, you should be familiar with the Appium desktop. So Perfecto has a plugin uh, like all the other cloud providers in the Appium desktop. The only thing that you need to specify is the cloud URL and your security token. Then you provide your session ID that you get from the Perfecto Cloud, and you can start doing uh, test automation like in the current slide, in the current screenshot, showing how you can interact with all the elements on the real device in the cloud. In this example, is the Galaxy Note 10, uh, but uh, basically it's uh, a seamless integration allowing you to do test automation development on iOS and Android using the Appium desktop or standardly do it with the Appium uh, APIs from the IntelliJ or other IDE. Um, before I go uh, to the next slide, <clears throat> I want to tell you that um, Perfecto is uh, already uh, working with the Appium community and trying to push some additional uh, changes, content, some bug fixes. So we are in constant uh, communication with the Appium community. Hopefully, we can uh, uh, provide more insights in the near future about some uh, recent changes that we are suggesting to add into the Appium open source project. Uh, with that, Science Rini, I would like to hand it over to you uh, to start talking about some advanced automation abilities and also give us some demonstrations uh, on uh, these topics. So the slides are now cool. yours. Uh, cool. Thanks, Ren. Uh, thanks for taking us through uh, Perfecto integrations with Appium. And let's go through uh, some of the cool features that uh, uh, Appium has introduced in its recent versions one of which is in-app authentication using Face ID. I think it's been almost uh, two plus years that iOS devices started supporting Face ID. And we had initially Touch ID to authenticate our mobile devices, iOS devices basically. And then we uh, moved towards Face ID, then Apple completely removed Touch ID altogether. So. Uh, uh, APM is able to support the testing of uh, in-app authentications on iOS simulators basically using Face ID, and it was supporting Touch ID authentication initially as well for on the lower end of iOS devices. So, uh, yep, and it's basically only on iOS simulators, not on the real devices. And it has only three limited controls. One is enrolling uh, our face, it's quite similar to scanning our face during our device setup and enabling the feature altogether. And next is uh, matching our face, and next is unmatching or non-matching our face. So uh, as you all know, Selenium and APM strictly follows uh, W3C standards, which is the web driver protocol. And uh, some of these features of in-app authentication using Face ID is not defined in the W3C standard, which is quite specific to platform like uh, it's a feature specific to iOS platform now. So APM provides another way of uh, utilizing these kind of features specific to platform, which is using mobile colon methods. So APM defines its own API and uh, exposes to the outer world using mobile colon methods. And uh, uh, one of the uh, mobile colon method that we could see here in the screen is uh, uh, biometric one is, that is the send biometric match, which takes up two arguments, which is face ID and uh, the parameter uh, and the exact value for it could be true or false to per perform a perfect match and to perform a non-matching face and to figure out what our uh, how our application behaves when we show when we do a non-matching face uh, face mismatch, basically. So. Uh, uh, in the recent times, we have we see that a lot of uh, 
uh, applications adopts to this face id feature of ios for performing its signing for signing into the application or to perform uh, any payment re related informations on the screen through face app authent face id authentication basically so in order to validate whether uh, face id authentication works using uh, works perfectly fine with a matched face or uh, doesn't work how does this application behaves with unmatched face previous to that we have to enroll our application uh, enroll the biometric process first so we have another uh, mobile colon method specific to enrolling the biometric which is nothing but enroll biometric it takes up the argument of is enabled it can be either true or false and uh, it is okay to enable this multiple times uh, 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 the simulators are clever enough to understand it uh, but uh, but on a valid case it is good to enable it on uh, probably once per test or only once altogether and then we can uh, send up we can use uh, send biometric mismatch once it is enabled we can send uh, actual face id authentication either true or false using the mobile colon method called send biometric mismatch so this is one of the cool feature that we got in recently in a uh, recent version of apm and another feature that uh, is uh, that we recently introduced uh, is apm's events api so one of the uh, painful process in APM is its own installation itself. So uh, I have seen literally people struggling a lot during the APM installation on Windows or uh, uh, Windows or Mac devices. So uh, uh, especially on iOS, because we have to, if it is real device, it's a different process. If it is simulators, it might be a little easier because the signing and everything comes in picture on real device, whereas in simulators, uh, there is not much hiccup, but yeah, there is initially if you have in, uh, if you are not familiar with APM's installation. So APM under the hood uses uh, WebDriver agent, heavily uh, developed by APM team, and initially contributed or owned by uh, Facebook team. So APM under the hood uses uh, uh, WebDriver agent, and it takes a lot of time to install if we do it for the first time. So there are a lot of things under the hood happens when APM uh, scripts are actually running in, uh, uh, running and uh, running to perform some actions on uh, application under test. So one of that is uh, starting or uh, installing, bundling the things, and then bundling the web driver agent and installing it on the real device or on the simulator. It takes a bit of time. So in order to understand how much time that uh apm took to install or start a simulator for that matters or for example navigating from uh, one event to another event or for uh, instantiating the simulator so all these things can be calculated uh, by just enabling lock timestamp which is another capability that we used to have for a long time but it's very difficult to understand how much time that uh, the certain process took for example starting a simulator took uh, probably two seconds on simulator A, probably five seconds on simulator B. And if we have multiple simulators up and running, it's going to be very difficult. And on a single APM server session, it's going to be very difficult to understand how much time a simulator A took to start and how much time simulator B took to start. And if we have multiple tests and multiple simulators up and running on a single server session, it's going to be crazy. So uh, one of the uh, a recent feature APM API, APM's event API is going to solve this mess. Uh, probably it's going to help us to understand better how, how much time the simulator A took to start and simulator B took to start. And uh, using log timestamp, it's going to be difficult because we can figure out the start time and end time, but if you have multiple simulators, then it's difficult. So you can use APM's events API, which has inbuilt events called server events which uh, one of those server event is nothing but uh, um, Xcode detail retrieval or probably simulator starting time is another server event. So these are some of the server events that uh, APM uh, provides us by default. And some of the other custom events could be, uh, for example, if I wanted to understand how much time does my application took to navigate from screen A to screen B, uh, consider you have a uh, application wherein you have to key in some details and press login and it navigates us to home screen of our application, how much time this navigation took place on particular simulator 
our particular real device. So uh, if we have a better code, probably without uh, any sleeps, uh, if you have a better code, then it's quite possible to understand how much time does this navigation of screen A to screen B took using IBM Ains API. And these custom events, out of server events, these custom events takes up uh, can be defined with the vendor and also an event name. The reason why we have uh, introduced vendor in the custom events is to enable some differentiation between uh, APM's own server events like a simulator start time and uh, our own custom events specific to our application. So here we have defined set vendor, which is a uh, Otka, one of the sample app that we are going to demonstrate in in few seconds, and the event name is on login screen. So we can start uh, providing much event names and then log these events whenever we feel that okay, we navigated from screen A to screen B. Consider we have navigated from screen A and logged an event, logged an event that we have specified, and then we can log another event to understand how much time that we spent on the second screen. So this is going to be uh, interesting, but uh, if we don't have a meaningful representation of this, uh, basically APM by default saves this information in a JSON file. APM team come up with another node module in order to provide this JSON information in a meaningful representation. So such meaningful representation is what we see in the right side of our screen. So it gives us a pictorial dep depiction of how much time a particular event takes place on the process of uh, automating our application under test. So let's see a short demo of uh, how does uh, in-app authentication works and how does uh, APM Events API is going to help us. Let me share my screen. I hope we are able to see my ID and iOS simulator. Yeah, I can see it. Cool. So let's start with the uh, iOS Synapse authentication test. As I said before, we are going to have uh, enroll biometric in order to start the enrollment process. Once it is done, we are going to perform send biometric match with face ID true and then face ID false. Have my APM uh, server up and running. Let me let me start the test. So have a sample application which uh, which has uh, in-app authentication in it on performing login and logout. So uh, and also in terms of uh, APM events API, apart from the server events, we have our own custom events on the login screen, which is the home screen, or the first screen, screen A, we can call out. Uh, we have a vendor, which is our app name, Otka, and we have a login screen, which is our own event name. We could see that uh, application under test is being installed in our simulator, and behind the scenes, we have our APM server up and running. We are logging the event. Once we have the application getting launched, we are going to perform a login button click. And then, and then we have another event. Once we have logged in, and we have performed the click, we have another event called logged in, and we are going to log that event once after we perform the authentication. Let's understand what's going on in the simulator. I think it's going to, it's installing the web driver under web driver agent then gonna start the test yep so we are in the home screen of our biometric we have the login button Did it ask for face id hmm. there's some failures yep always live demos are gonna be crazy <laughs> that's why it's called a live demo yeah yep Let's try again. It's the delays. If you want to avoid thread or sleep, yeah, you have to you have to wait for it. It's 
so have the apm events api uh, the node module that we used for uh, pictorial representation of the json is already installed cool it's going to perform logout yep it's logged out and it's going to try to authenticate with false face id and yeah this time i think it picked up the speed cool let's see uh, how does the even api worked out now so uh, i'm saving an even flow json it is going to generate uh, as an even flow dot json it's one of the name that i have given and the apm event parser is the node module that i was talking about it's going to print the timeline information for this input json hope everyone is able to see yep and these are the some of the server events that i was talking about xcode details and app configuration took 0.004 seconds if you take simulator startup time uh, prepping time it took around 3 seconds for installing the app it, it took around 9 seconds so these are some of the server events and one of the custom event that we have specified is login screen so on in order to launch our application and uh, show it in our simulator it took around 15 seconds and uh, post that it took some seconds almost 8 seconds to get into our logged in state which basically it includes enrolling our application and then performing a, a perfect match that's when we log in and then i haven't log uh, haven't uh, added a new event for logged out so that's when we have final event called event nc it took around 38 seconds and this helps us to figure out where exactly my uh, uh, where exactly app took a long time this helps us to figure out whether uh, this is one of the react native application that we are we are seen uh, for showcasing and uh, uh, we can figure out how much time that it took for uh, uh, launching the application and then uh, perform some actions and then moving towards the final screen yes excellent so i have That's... just a quick question sai on the demo uh, of the biometrics um so let's say i want to run uh, one script that uh, you know a single script that can run uh, both on a device that has fingerprint support but does not have face id and uh, the same script uh, on a device that has face id so uh, would i need like uh, because you know let's say you have an ipad uh, mini uh, an mm -hmm. ipad uh, which doesn't have face recognition it only only has fingerprint uh, you need okay. to do like switches and stuff like that uh, for face recognition yep. and uh, fingerprint yep uh, as i said before uh, if we replace face id in the send biometric match and if we replace this argument with the touch id and it takes up uh, boolean it's a boolean actually it can take true or false similar to face id so it can perform touch id authentication excellent excellent thank you cool go to sai for next one thank you sri and that was a lot of information we heard on custom events and uh, uh, the other stuff on the face ids and uh, biometric stuff so let's look at another very interesting uh, feature Uh, which is very quite quite handful one, uh, especially when you're running your uh, test on uh, real devices or simulators or emulators to see what exactly is actually happening on your device or simulators is basically uh, try to stream your application uh, onto the browser. Okay, and uh, but how do we do that, right? Uh, so there are a lot of other open source. Uh, tools available for us like uh, open stf and 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 stuff where we set up like private device farms and stuff but when when we speak very specific to uh, appm uh, and how can we do that right so what appm has done is so there is there are like two different apis one's like you say start video recording and stop video recording okay and uh, what exactly these two apis actually do so if you look at it with the naming itself it says start video recording and stop video recording right so we know for sure uh, they actually 
uh, start recording your screen of your device. And when you say stop, it stops recording your screen of your device. It's right? pretty straightforward. But also there's another advantage with that is once you start recording your screen, you can actually hit, hit a specific port on your browser, uh, like you see on the slide, where, where the specific screen is being displayed onto the browser. And uh, let's say you move from screen one to screen two, so you can typically actually see those uh, you know, navigations on of the screen from your device onto the browser. Okay, And how is this exactly happening, right? So what Appium is doing under the hood is uh, it uses FFmpeg. It's a server. And what they do is they actually stream your screen, uh, capturing the screenshots on and, and, and streaming them into the browser. Okay, So if you need this feature uh, to be uh, you know, workable with your Appium version, so all you need to do is you need to actually install FFmpeg uh, on your machine, and it should be in, into the path so that when Appium looks for it, it knows that, oh, yeah, I, I found an FFmpeg in the path, and I actually need that. Uh, and that way, uh, Appium can actually look for it. But there could be another possibility where you say that, hey, you know what? I'm actually running my test across devices, and uh, wh how can I configure the port numbers, or, or how do I know what the port number I need to talk to, right? If it's one device, by default, Appium uh, starts this FFmpeg server on 9100. So if you look into your Appium logs, you could actually uh, you know, see a lot of uh, these informations there. Okay, But let's say now, uh, like I said, if you are running your test across multiple uh, simulators or devices, and you want to actually uh, look at your uh, screen on the browser. So in that case, definitely you have to give multiple uh, different ports, like different unique ports. So you could do this through another capability which is provided, which is called uh, MJPEG server URL. Um, so you can look at the capability li list that they are like about more than 280 capabilities uh, for both iOS and Android uh, together. So you could see that there is a capability for this where you can actually uh, set the port number uh, to a random one and you can actually hit that and that's going to actually stream a specific uh, device screen onto your browser. This is a quite a handy one for us to do uh, uh, if you want to see exactly what's happening onto your devices. Let's say you're, you're hooked your device to another CI machine and other things. So it, it goes quite handy to see uh, what's the test case running and which screen it is in and, and other things. Okay, so. So this is like an uh, inbuilt stuff which comes with Appium uh, out of the box for you. Uh, this is a very cool feature, and I've been using this for a very long time, and, and it gives a lot of uh, advantage over that. But let's say for Android, right? No, no, what happens to Android? For Android, we don't have like direct APIs which we could use, but uh, there are like third-party streaming applications where you can actually install on your device and start your streaming, and you could actually get the port number and do exactly the same what we did for iOS. And uh, if you need to know more about how we do this for Android and what sort of streaming applications are there, uh, you should definitely go to Appium Pro uh, uh, blog, which uh, Jonathan does. So there is a blog which is uh, got a detailed information on it. Okay, cool. And uh, so that's about the video streaming and stuff. So let's see a demo on, uh, sl slowly down the lane on how this actually uh, works and stuff. Cool. So the next one, what we see is going to be a different uh, locator, uh, which is uh, called the data matcher. Okay, so what is data matcher? So data matcher is another new locator strategy. So when we say a locator strategy, uh, the locator strategies are like uh, driver dot find element by ID, by XPath, by CSS, by name, and by tag and stuff, right? And when it is specific to our uh, mobile, it's going to be. Let's say if we take it for iOS, it's going to be. Uh, find a uh, driver dot find element by iOS class chain predicates and and all of that stuff right a similar way this is a a very a very new cool uh, uh, locator strategy which is called a data matcher okay and if you go into your clients uh, you when you say driver dot find element you should you could actually find this saying driver dot find android uh, by tag name uh, something like that and uh, what basically this would do over there is so if you see in a lot of other cases, uh, the current uh, driver which you use for your Android is UI Automator 2, right? And Espresso is Espresso driver is, is the new driver. And I would recommend everyone to uh, try Espresso driver. I think going going forward, you know, Appium would uh, more contribute into Espresso driver 
until the community starts using that and report bugs back to the community, which is Appium, the Appium team really can't uh, go ahead and uh, sort of do because uh, it's open source. So we need uh, more people to help us understand what exactly is happening so the Appium team can actually go ahead, uh, you know, give feature requests and bug fixes and other things. Okay, So that's an Espresso driver. So all you need to do is to use this locator, you need to sort of set your automation name as Espresso driver. So in your capabilities. So by default, today you might know you're using UI Automator 2 uh, as your automation uh, backend. Uh, but if you want to use this locator strategy, you need to tell Appium, hey, you know what? Uh, I'm going to choose uh, Espresso driver as my backend. Uh, and, uh, you know, and Appium is going to like sort of uh, uh, start up your server and do all the preps uh, with the Espresso driver and not UI Automator 2 driver. Okay. So how is this locator quite different from any other uh, locators, right? So I'll give a very good example over here. Is what you see on the screen over here is a is, is a data matcher view. It's basically an, an adapter view, okay, uh, which has got a list of items in it, and you keep scrolling and you keep getting items from the list. Okay, and uh, what happens over here is, uh, let's say if you want to if you want to click on a specific item which is not present on the screen, okay, and in today's world what we do is uh, we try to write some. Uh, uh, swipe, so we keep swiping, and uh, once you do a swipe with X and Y coordinates, on a, or, or even on an element, and then you lo sort of look for that specific element which is which is not on your screen to see if it's present on your screen. And how do you do that? There are multiple ways to do. I've seen a lot of people saying that. Okay, I'm going to take a page source, and uh, through the page source, I'm going to see if it's present. Or uh, some people I've seen they do they look for the ID. Uh, and if the ID throws saying no such element and they catch the element and then they say, oh, okay, it's not there. And again, they keep going up, right? Uh, which is a quite time consuming for you uh, because you haven't yet still come to the step which you want to actually do, right? That's the action. And what the action is, the action is to like click on a, a specific list, uh, which is not on your screen. Uh, so with this data matcher, what you could do over there is you could actually just tell Appium, uh, that, hey, you know what? Uh, you can construct a data matcher saying, click on this right? and click on a text, let's say like a clock, uh, which is not on the screen. And uh, what Espresso driver would do is underneath, it's going to convert your driver.find element by a uh, data matcher uh, and to what the Espresso native driver can actually understand. Okay. And uh, what it's going to do at that point of time is it's going to scroll on its own and then it's going to click. So which means you don't have to write your swipe, your scroll, and check if the element is present and all of that stuff. Uh, but rather, uh, the locator is going to do that for you, which is like pretty cool uh, because that's going to save a lot of time as well when you like scroll and and then like wait for the element and then see if it's on the page and blah blah blah, right? And the the snippet which you which you see on the screen is basically uh, a snippet which is. Uh, equal to what you write in a in a very low level espresso uh, driver language, okay. Uh, that's the thing. And uh, yeah, so let's do one thing. Let's very quickly uh, go in, go into a very short demo uh, to see uh, how the video streaming works and other things. And then maybe when when it's streaming up, we can parallelly uh, I can take you through more on what exactly the code looks like and and other things. So let's look at uh, the first thing what we see over here is for the iOS part is uh, you're going to start recording and you're going to stop recording. What we could do here is for, I think instead of running them, it's good that we debug it uh, so that we we start the recording and we don't stop that immediately. And we start playing around with the app and simultaneously open a browser and uh, then see uh, that, you know, the app and the browser side by side. Let the test run and we let APM do what it has to do. And there we go. So we see APM server logs. So things are happening in the background, which is pretty good. Oh, we forgot to change the capabilities to start. Let's do a debug.
and the whole reason for us to debug this test and not run them is just basically uh, click on the app see the browser so that we get to see exactly what's happening uh, and um, and and that's why we are trying to do that There we go. So we have the app launched. So let's get into the browser and uh, let's uh, hit that specific port number, which is localhost colon 9100. And uh, I'm hoping that we see the screen then. We should be able to see that. Boom. There we go. So what you see is exactly the screen on the simulator. So let's start interacting with it, okay? So let's click on a login button now move around the app uh, just to see, we also see the, exactly the same screen, uh, what we see on the uh, browser now, okay? Uh, let's click on drag and drop, let's drag and drop, you see that? So what the actions will be performed, well, uh, which is pretty cool. So like I said, we could actually see exactly what's happening on your device onto your browser. So let's see uh, how a code a code snippet uh, looks for uh, the data matcher. So let's quickly go into a data matcher and see how the code snippet for a data matcher looks like. And uh, then we can go ahead and talk about uh, some of the very interesting uh, stuff. We can just go and see how, how the code snippet looks like there, right? So you see over here, uh, let's take about uh, the, the first few lines are all about capabilities so i'm not going to pretty much uh, take take you through what these capabilities are actually okay and if you see uh, at the last line over there which is find element by android data matcher right so that was exactly the locator which i was talking about uh, which is uh, find element by data matcher and basically uh, for that you basically need to say uh, you know you need to say what is the data matcher supposed to do Okay, and uh, basically you need to construct an object within an array, and the array is going to have like a like a title, uh, which the title is nothing but the title what you want to click on, which is on the screen. So in this case, it's like a title which is going to be a test text clock. Okay, and uh, uh, that's nothing but uh, just a uh, that's a text which which is visible on the screen. Okay, and uh, and and the next one which we uh, see over there is uh, as a has entry uh, that's a pretty interesting stuff which i have to mention here so the has entry is also a hamcrest assertion over here so uh, espresso driver and this data matcher specifically also accepts hamcrest so if you want to know more about hamcrest and stuff i would recommend google through uh, what are these hamcrest assertions and stuff there are a lot of stuffs in it uh, one of them is it says hey can you check if there's an entry uh, with a title uh, as in uh, text block okay so that's going to do that for you so I would strongly recommend look at what are the different Hamcrest assertions that we have uh, if you want to know uh, what's exactly the value that we want to give for the key name there. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, that, that, that code's pretty straightforward. So I'm not going to like deep dive into the code, what exactly is going to do and other things. So we could go in and see a very important, uh, uh, a very important feature which we want to talk today is about our Actions API. Okay. So let's see what the Actions API look like, what are they, and all of the other things. Okay, And um, so with mobile applications, right? Uh, often mobile applications uh, involve the use of touch gestures, 
like I know day in day out, you know, time in time out, we people use mobile where we sort of try to do tap and a uh, and a uh, scroll up and you try to swipe. Uh, and uh, sometimes I've seen some applications which is quite complex, which has got some complex gestures as well, uh, which has got like a like a pinch and zoom uh, and maybe a two finger like a two finger or a three finger tap or or maybe like the one which you see in the image over here which says a press and then drag and drop. Like, so you, you basically going to use like uh, two fingers, your two hands, one hand to say a press on an element. And another one is like, you know, to move around uh, on, onto the screen. Right. See, these are very complex gestures actually. So, but, but we always had some troubles with getting these gestures working and but, but why? Right. Because uh, the way things were with iOS and Android is quite different. And right? I need to probably go back uh, in time. Uh, when RPM uh, started supporting gestures long back. So uh, if I can remember, there were like time where we used to say, uh, if, you know, specific to a platform, if it's iOS and Android, we used to say swipe to, scroll to, uh, and just the swipe. And the swipe used to take like four coordinates with an element. And there was a lot of confusion between whether it's a relative element, a re uh, whether it's a relative coordinate or an absolute coordinate and, and all of this stuff, right? And uh, because RPM had this goal of uh, compatibility uh, with WebDriver because under the hood, uh, Appium uses all the clients of Appium actually uses Selenium, right? So, so basically, we said we would agree to uh, the protocols of WebDriver. Okay, and WebDriver, Selenium WebDriver is more of a web thing uh, and not for mobile, right? Because it's got a mouse and uh, and all of that stuff, uh, and it was not something very close to a, a mobile. So, what Appium did was. Uh, in our side, the Appium team, what they did was they took these uh, uh, APIs, which was native to iOS and Android, and uh, we sort of exposed uh, certain functions to it. Uh, but they were always tricky because uh, uh, it, it didn't have the flexibility to say, hey, this is what you want to do. How do I want to move? How do I want to create my gesture? It was not fully like uh, open to the user at that point of time. Okay. And... Uh, and some of these, uh, so at that point of time, what the team did was, okay, because we rely on, uh, uh, you know, Selenium Web Drivers protocol, so we started we started saying that, okay, we could introduce a mobile colon prefix, saying that uh, we say driver.execute script mobile colon prefix. So if there's a prefix on the mobile, we know, okay, this is related to the mobile and we can do all of that stuff, okay? Uh, but then uh, there was a lot of challenges which we, as a team, as an Appium team that we faced, okay? And at that point of time, then we got to know that uh, the Selenium project was working on a better and a more general specification for touch actions. Uh, and uh, the Appium team uh, looked at it and uh, the APIs were proposed as a part of the new W3C web driver specifications, which was under, under development at that point of time. And all the Appium clients gave it a try including the server to like sort of respect these W3C uh, specifications uh, for these APIs. And uh, what are those APIs? That one API is called the action spec. It's called the action uh, API. Okay. Uh, so we could go ahead and see what these action APIs are, how do we use them, and how do we construct a gesture? How do we com construct a very complex gesture uh, using these uh, action APIs? Okay. And... So with these action APIs, so you see on the screen, so that there are a few uh, input po pointer inputs, and uh, the action API basically, uh, uh, you know, holds these four pointer inputs, which is pointer move, pointer up, pointer down, and a pause. Okay. So basically, we're going to look at all these four uh, and uh, see how we can actually uh, construct a very complex gesture over here. And what does pointer one do? Source is nothing but an element. Uh, or it could be uh, a, spe a specific coordinate uh, where you want to actually, you know, take your pointer to. Okay, so move, move pointer down. Uh, so basically, it starts with the pointer move. So it's like uh, let's assume this case, right? So where, uh, uh, so let's take a mo mobile device where where we use, and let's say even before you scroll your screen from top bottom to top, what we do is we basically take our index finger. And then we first move on to the specific uh, location in your mobile, right? So that's basically a point of move. So, you, so, so that, that's basically a point of move, which means you're pointing your finger to a specific location, 
okay and once you do that you're going to point it down so which means you're going to press your finger down onto your screen which is your pointer down on an element okay and once you do a pointer down you basically again do a pointer move so because you move you're moving from one point to another okay so you do a pointer move once you do a pointer move basically you have done what you have to do so what you do is you remove your finger from the screen right so basically you do a pointer up okay so you see it's like pointer move pointer down and then a and a pointer up uh, and uh, and stuff so what is this pause right what does pause do over here so basically pause is like uh is something like you do a pointer move and you do a pointer down so you have your finger pressed so with, and then you say okay i'm going to pause like for a few seconds now before i move to the point okay so that's basically uh the pause over there okay so let's let's look at this one uh, very good example over here what you see on the screen is basically uh, you see some x and y coordinates of it of this and uh, the, at the top corner what you see 0 comma 0 so that's going to be uh the location from the top right which is going to be your notification bar and stuff okay so what we're going to do over here is we're going to take the x and y location of a specific element which is calling which is saying uh, x x y x1 y1 and uh, and uh, uh, that's to the x axis and x2 y1 or x2 y2 or whatever the value to be that's going to be to the y axis okay and uh, this is basically what you see is how you calculate the coordinates over here but that's not what is important for us to understand what an action api is we going to like understand how do we use these action apis or how do we construct a very a complex uh, gesture using these action apis so let's deep dive into it let's see a very quick uh, code snippet and a demo on uh, what exactly uh, uh you know how do we implement these apis uh using the action api so we we recommend the community uh to look at these action apis going forward uh and not not stick with the touch actions going forward uh, is is what i want to like put it out here so we could look look at a very quick demo on how these action apis are, are being used So if you see uh, the code snippet over here uh I'm going to ignore the first few lines of the horizontal swiping test because it's basically getting into the app you wait for an element and all of that stuff right uh I'm going to start start off from uh the get location stuff which is line uh, 38 so you say slider.get location right so slider is an element and we're basically getting the uh, location of the element and that that's going to give you a pointer for you and what basically the pointer is going to be the pointer is going to have and x and y uh, coordinates in it okay and uh, now we do a pointer input so that's another api like we like i like we just spoke about the different stuff so it's a point a pointer input api which is from selenium so whatever you see over here is nothing to do with any of the apm clients they all are pure selenium dependencies they all are coming from selenium dependencies okay so we say a uh, new pointer input and we say the pointer input should be a kind of touch we say it's a touch because it's a mobile screen so it's a kind of touch uh, and uh, and then we call it a finger okay and uh, why do we call it a finger why can it be anything else yeah it can be anything else it can be your name and my name it really doesn't matter because it's basically a string which selenium actually needs uh, to compile okay and uh, so that's good and the next one is the important stuff is the sequence so you're going to create a sequence now which means what what is a sequence right so like i explained in the previous slide a sequence is nothing but uh, the the pointer inputs like pointer down pointer up pause so these are all the sequences that you want to create okay so once we create an object of the sequence now we need to add actions which is nothing but uh, you know create an object with a sequence which is like uh, you add an action you say uh, create pointer move like i said you're moving your finger to a specific location so we need an x and y uh, location Uh, and then you say pointer down so which means you you're pointing it down now so you're pressing your finger on your mobile screen imagine it that way and once you're done with that and then we say a pause over there okay we'll come back to this point of the pause why we need a pause okay so do we a pause over there and then once the pause is done then we say now you move so you move to point b from point a right so you're going to move something you're performing an action from point a to point uh, b so we do a move over there 
And when you do a move over there, again, you need to give another coordinate where the move should happen. So which means what's the destination? Where do I need to really go? So we need to tell uh, that coordinates over there. Okay. And once that's done, you do a pointer up because you reach the destination, so which means uh, you're going to remove your finger off from the screen. So that's exactly what's happening over there. Okay. And, and a very interesting part is this one line, which is like you say driver.perform, and the perform takes a collection of list, and uh, you're going to give it a sequence uh, of drag and drop. Okay. So let's run this test and uh, see how it executes. And then maybe we look at into another code snippet uh, of a, another complex gesture. So we, let's go ahead and execute and see how this is working and, and, and other things. So if you see this example, we have not used any of these, uh, a, a lot of these code snippets, what we see like our touch actions, new touch actions, wait, wait for an element and other things. So if you see over here, we, are, we expected it to move. You saw the slider moved actually to a specific point, right? Uh, so that's exactly what's happening. So if we see, let's take, let's look at another example over here, right? Because I said that these are basically sequences. Uh, so they could be, it could handle with any number of elements, right? Like two finger, three finger, or two hand, and all of that stuff. So look at this, uh, another sequence where we have a multi-test, okay? So where you use two fingers uh, to sort of slide those two uh, sliders, uh, like you use two fingers to slide uh, both those sliders at the same time. So you see, we have two sliders over here. So typically, if you if you can point to two fingers and you can idly swipe them, right? So let's, let's see how the test actually uh, looks in that case, okay? Let's slightly uh, go down and see how the test looks. So basically with the multi uh, sequences, all that what you need to do is, basically it's two elements, right? So if it is two elements for a multi-test, uh, what you need to do is you need to create two sources, your two sequences and two uh, uh, po pointer inputs for you. And and then the driver is, uh, and then the, like I said, the driver.perform is gonna take a collection. Uh, <clears throat> So the driver dot collection is going to take a collection. So let's see that uh, how you could actually uh, send that into that specific test. Okay. So if you if you look at, uh, I'm just uh, looking around where the test could be. Maybe this is also a good example for a pinch and zoom. So it it does a uh, uh, two sequence for you. So you see we created two sequences over here. Okay, and which is nothing but uh, you're going to perform two actions on the same screen at the same time. Okay. So if we if we scroll down and look at the driver dot perform now, uh, that will take an, uh, a an, a collection of list which is like pinch and zoom one and pinch and zoom two. So which is like sequence one and sequence two, and they both will execute at the same time, and they will not wait for each other. Okay. So this way you can also perform uh, multiple uh, complex gestures, uh, whether it's a, a, a one finger or a two finger or three fingers. So basically, it's just a a pattern of uh, uh, sequences for you. That's it. Cool. Uh, that's 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 something which I really want to talk about. Uh, the actions uh, API. Uh, give it a try, and now we're here to help you. Thank you. <clears throat> this is. Uh... Truly exciting, I'm sure that many uh, of our audiences uh, may have not experienced uh, these, these capabilities, so uh, truly insightful. And um, uh, Sai, Sunny, if they want uh, to get access to these code samples, uh, where can they get it? Uh, you know, it's in the group, so we can provide that at the end of the session. Okay. Um, so let's just uh, move to the one before the, the final uh, section of this webinar. And I'm going to run for you very short, two short demonstrations. One of them is going to be around uh, the ability, uh, as Science Rini, uh demonstrated, the biometric support. Uh, so um, I'm going to run a very short uh, demo snippet showing you how you can use biometrics uh, on a real 
device on the Perfecto Cloud, as well as an instrumented uh, application that uh, take advantage of the camera APIs uh, to do image injection. So think about uh, trying to automate a check deposit for your banking application. So instead of you know capturing an image uh, which means nothing, while you're actually clicking on the on the camera button, uh, it's going to inject an image uh, for you to test your uh, banking or other uh, image-based application scenario. So um, I'm going to now run the the video for you. Uh, let's see that it starts. One second. Okay, you should be able to see uh, on your screen right now uh, the video starting. So this is a real uh, iOS device on the Perfecto Cloud. Uh, first, it's going to start uh, the uh, biometrics test, the, the face uh, ID login to the uh, expense application, and then it's going to perform an image injection uh, to simply insert uh, a receipt of something that you purchased into the uh, application. So this is how uh, you know the biometrics works. Uh, later in this, uh, the next slide, I will actually show you uh, a, a bit of the code that is used under the hood. Um, so that's the uh, the Touch ID authentication. Here we want to inject uh, a receipt for an expense report, uh, maybe like a, a coffee or a meal or something like that. Basically, we're going to put the amount inject the amount uh, into the application and uh, so when you want to do the attachment and add the image into this uh, application soon you will see that uh, once clicking on the camera button actually an image is being injected uh, to the app uh, as an attachment and that's how you know perfecto adds to the selenium and appium uh, capabilities this image injection uh, ability so you see the permission, and uh, obviously this device is based in the cloud, but when you click on the camera, you see that the PayPal image was injected, uh, and that's the seed that was added into the script. So that's the first uh, demo that I wanted to show you. Uh, and the next one, but that's, that's the code snippet, so that's the image injection. We are injecting, once you click on the camera, this coffee receipt uh, JPEG file. Uh, to the native app context, and then basically when you click on the capture, that's when you actually get uh, the actual image that you want to validate. The next demo is uh, about uh, something truly exciting. So uh, this is about uh, trying to do audio validation. Uh, in this example, we're using Slack to perform a call between two real devices, and we are actually validating the audio uh, of the, the, uh, one of the calls uh, and converting it into text. So uh, turn on the volume because you're going to hear uh, uh, you're going to hear uh, the the call being entered to the Slack native application, and you will also hear some of the voice being talked uh, during the uh, during the call itself. So a call is now being initiated. You will soon hear the call entering. And by the way, during or after the webinar, if you want to get the uh, repository, the code repository, just let us know. We can share the code with you. Um, I hope you can hear the call, uh, the incoming call. We are hearing some audio. I'm sure that you cannot understand all the audio. Our phone and native land, true patriot love, and all our sons command with blowing hearts. We see the rise of the Lord, strong and free from far and wide. Oh, Canada, we stand on guard for thee. Good. So an audio was uh, sent to the to the other device between these two devices. Now, Perfecto is using an open source. Uh, audio to uh, voice to uh, voice to text uh, to simply validate 
the audio file that was uh, played during the call, and you will see in a few seconds that we were able to capture the audio and convert it into text. So that's another way of validating things like either voice calls, chatbots, uh, voice assistant, and stuff like that. So it's nice. It's a nice, cool use case that uh, we've developed within Perfecto. Um, uh, so again, you can get also the source, the demo uh, on your on your uh, machine as well. So, and by the way, that's that's how that's the code snippet. I hope you can see. Uh, in any case, we can share the the full repository. But basically, we're using a command of mo mobile audio recording start and stop. And uh, this is the output file that we are converting into a text uh, from a, a wave wave file into text. Um, so that's basically the advanced demo that we wanted to show. Just before we, we are wrapping this webinar, um, Science Sunny would like to take us to what's coming in Appium 2.0. Uh, so Science Sunny, let us know about the cool features that are coming, and if you have a projection date on when Appium 2.0 is expected to be released, let us know as well. Cool. Thanks, Aran. Yep, Sunny here. And uh, thanks, Aran, for taking us through the video clips. And next is APM 2.0. So as we all know, APM has a bunch of drivers. Uh, one is APM driver, base driver, and then next is uh, uh, individual platform specific drivers like uh, uh, iOS XUIT driver, iOS XUIT driver. Initially, we had something called iOS UI automation driver. And for Android, we have UI automator driver, and then we have Espresso driver. And Windows, for Windows, we have Windows driver. So Appium has a lot and lot of drivers around it. And uh, what's the main philosophy behind uh, Appium's 2.0 that uh, Jonathan has proposed to the team is uh, have a bunch of drivers and bunch of plugins in it. And the credits to everyone in the team involved for get, uh, getting this uh, discussion around. And basically, APM, APM driver will be very lightweight. And uh, each and every drivers, for example, UA Automator 2 driver will have uh, its own independent lifecycle and its own versions, independent ecosystem. So and uh, uh, if in case if I have a mobile application that's only for, I, uh, only for iOS, I can only install that specific driver. So. Uh, it's going to be a lightweight uh, APM driver and uh, user-specific driver that can be installed for based on our needs. So currently in APM 1.x, if we install APM, it installs bunch and bunch of drivers. Even if we don't use XEUI, it will install uh, on the system. But in case of APM 2.0, it's going to be simple. We are going to have uh, we are going to install what we are going to uh, what we are going to use. And in terms of plugin, it's going to be an arbitrary functionality that we can uh, add at any point in time into the ecosystem. So as I said, APM 2.0, uh, anyone can create a driver and maintain its own life cycle. And all APM core is going to maintain is the list of supported drivers based on the name. And uh, anyone can, uh, it, it's, as I said, it's going to have individual and uh, independent versioning maintained by the team or maintained by someone in the community and uh, no drivers will be included into the APM by default. So it's going to be faster. So it's going to make our life easy in terms of installation. So plugins, yep, it's going to add arbitrary functionalities at any moment in time if you would like to add your own plugin. So this plugin ecosystem has been there for a while and many other uh, on many other libraries in the market. One of which is uh, Tyco, another one is WebDriver.io, which follows a plugin-based ecosystem. That's we wanted to bring it to APMs 2.0, and where we can any user can add arbitrary functionalities around APM commands and maintain or modify uh, anything that they would like to do. And it can be distributed and installed uh, the same way as drivers. So it's going to have the plugins also similar to uh, drivers. Going to have its own ecosystem, its own versioning. And it's going to be a tiny piece of code, not the full driver itself. 
and it's again implement a specific Node.js interface to work with APM. So these are some of the cool things apart from features that are coming up in APM 2.0, and we can expect this to be up and live. And we have already uh, the work has been started, and it's in PR. The discussion is on, and uh, we are fine tuning it. And I, I, we can expect this to be uh, available after a bunch of beta. Once it's been completely tested out by betas, then it's going to be live somewhere on the end of this year. We can expect this to be available for public use very, in the very, community. Very cool. Now that that's very very cool. Um, actually, one of the questions uh, from the audience were uh, when it's coming. So you actually just answered it. Uh, so we should uh, continue following both you, you guys online uh, updating on the Appium 2.0 scoping, uh, the beta releases, and obviously the release itself together with Jonathan Lips uh, Appium Pro newsletter that also gives uh, more insights and indications. So with that, I would like, uh, we have just uh, a very short amount of time and we, we have a few questions. Let me at least pick one or two questions from the audience and the rest we'll just address after this webinar. So Science Rini, one of the questions was around, can the Action API work with Android and iOS, single code for both or not? Uh I take this question. So the answer is both yes and no. Uh, what I'm saying yes and no is we need to make a slight change in your code. Uh, so we spoke about the pointer inputs of pause, right? So you need to have a pause for iOS, but you need you don't need a pause for an Android. So that's the only one change which you need to do. Uh, apart from that, uh, all the other sequence constructions and all of that is going to still be the same. Excellent. Uh, the, the next question was around, uh, should we use Espresso driver or UI automation going forward? What's the recommendation? Like I, like I said in the previous slide, we would recommend using the community the Espresso driver. Uh, only when the community uses and uh, you know, comes back saying, uh, this is still what we're expecting as a feature or there are some issues. Until and unless we want to know how to improve the driver. Uh, yes, I would, I would recommend the community to look at Espresso Driver. So just to make sure, you are recommending to use the Espresso Driver going forward? Yep. Yes, if they don't have any inter-app communication. So like app one to app two, six, and those cases, if they don't have that, yeah, I would recommend looking at Espresso Driver. Awesome. And last final question. Question quickly is uh, does Appium 2.0 simplify the Appium installation? I think you gave a clue in your uh, Appium 2.0 slides, but let's just address that one. Yep, but it's going to be uh, quite simple than what we were doing before. So we are not going to install the bunch of drivers that we have. We are going to install what we are going to use. So it's going to be uh, simpler than what it was before in Appium's 1.x. Awesome. It's going to be simple and also lightweight, so that's also a good, yeah. uh, good, good information and insight for the community. Okay, guys. So with that, I would like to thank both of you for taking the time, providing us uh, with demos, insights, best practices to use Appium, and also giving us a, a sneak peek to what's coming in Appium 2.0. Uh, and I uh, hope to do uh, more activities and webinars with you going forward. So again, thank you for joining us, and uh, we'll be in touch uh, in the next webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Ram. Thank you.